Your extensive posting history on R Birds with Arms and your old fanfiction heavy live journal are both one tiny math problem away from becoming public knowledge. That math problem is prime number factoring, and the new era of quantum computers may lay bare your indiscretions as well as collapse the entire digital economy. Unless we get some post quantum cryptography post haste. So, how close are we? It's said that quantum computers will threaten the security of our digital civilization because they can easily overcome the encryption method that underpins almost all of it. Every email, every online purchase, every login is secured by the fact that it's a lot harder to factor out prime numbers than it is to multiply them together. Large products of prime numbers become encryption locks and the prime numbers that go into them become the keys to the secrets in your inbox. Your secrets are safe-ish for now because the most powerful classical computers will take thousands to billions of years to find those factors depending on the key size. But in 1994, a mathematician named Peter Shaw developed an algorithm, Shaw's algorithm, that could use a quantum computer to factor a prime number in, well, a human lifetime or a human lunch break. Quantum computers did not exist in 1994, but just last year, Google's quantum computer, Sycamore, outsped the best classical computers for a very specific task. According to the researchers, Sycamore performed calculations to simulate another quantum system exponentially faster than would have been possible with a pure classical computer. We'll talk about exactly what happened here in another episode, but what does this mean for internet cryptography? Is it game over? Not quite. Quantum computers need to become far more reliable, have better fault tolerance, and or support vastly more qubits to do the sort of prime factoring required for decryption. But those computers will eventually arrive, so what's to be done? One option is to match quantum decryption with new quantum encryption techniques to replace prime factoring. We talked about this in our episode on quantum key distribution, and we've also talked about the challenges. To distribute a quantum key, you also need a quantum internet to transport quantum states. This is a far more challenging problem. Quantum states are insanely fragile and difficult to transport, and the quantum internet may not arrive before better quantum computers can crack current encryption techniques and collapse the modern digital world. Fortunately, there is another option, and one that'll be a lot cheaper than building a quantum internet. It turns out that there are some ingenious non-quantum ways to thwart the hacking powers of quantum computers. Enter post-quantum cryptography or quantum resistant algorithms, which might replace our vulnerable prime factoring based cryptography. To understand why some algorithms are vulnerable to quantum computing attacks while others are thought to be quantum resistant, we need to review a bit about encryption. Prime factoring is an example of what we call a one-way function. That's a mathematical operation that's very easy to figure out in one direction, but very difficult to reverse. Let's start with a more visual example. Let's say Alice has a secret shade of yellow. Bob has a secret shade of blue. And there's a shade of red that is publicly broadcast. That's the public key. Alice combines her yellow with the public shade of red, which gives her an orange. Bob combines his blue with the red to get a purple. Then Alice sends her orange to Bob and Bob sends his purple to Alice. And then Alice combines Bob's purple with her yellow and Bob combines Alice's orange with his blue. The resulting brown is a shared secret that can be used to encode text between them. Unless an eavesdropper, Eve, can unmix Alice and Bob's colors, she can't figure out what the shared secret key is. The current dominant encryption protocol uses prime factors instead of colors. And this is the RSA protocol named after Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Adelman, who came up with it in 1977. It works great, except for its vulnerability to Shor's algorithm and quantum computers. But prime factoring is only one example of a one-way function. Are there other possibilities that don't have the same vulnerability? Well, to understand that, we need a brief word on how quantum computers do their magic. If you try prime factorization using a classical computer, you're stuck using an algorithm similar to one that was developed over 2000 years ago by the Greek mathematician Eratosthenes. 
First, divide a number by two and see if you get an integer. If not, try three, five, seven, 11, 13, and so on. This is laborious. It takes an insane amount of time to factor large numbers this way. Or you could try run an insane number of computers in parallel to check every different factor. Still effectively impossible. Shaw's algorithm is potentially exponentially faster. For the full explanation, I'm gonna point you to the episodes made by Infinite Series a while back. Today, we'll just do the quick version. It turns out that there's a structure to factorization that can be exploited by quantum computers. That structure is a period. For example, let's consider powers of two. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 10, 24. If we divide these powers by, let's say a random number, five, and look at the remainder in an operation called mod, we get two, four, three, one, two, four, three, one, two, four, three, one. It repeats every four numbers. It turns out that if you can figure out the period of this sequence, you can figure out the original number, in this case, the two. The 18th century mathematician, Leonard Euler, figured out this structure extends to numbers that are the multiple of two prime numbers, just like our RSA numbers. Now that doesn't help us immediately. For the powers of large numbers, guessing the period is as hard as guessing the factors. It would take at least as long or require at least as many parallel classical computers. And this is where quantum weirdness comes in. Classical computers store information in bits that are either zero or one. Quantum computers store information in qubits, which until they give an output are in a quantum superposition of zero and one, with some probability of either being measured when you try to read out the qubit. So a set of qubits can be in any one of a large number of possible states, and each state represents a different number, each with a different probability. You can think of each state as being like a parallel processor, but now instead of processing across different computers, you're processing in different parts of the quantum wave function or in different parallel realities if you're into the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. The problem with this parallel processing is that you only get one answer when you try to read out the qubits. If you tried to use a quantum computer to guess the factors of a prime number, you'd read out one of the guesses, but it's no more likely to be correct than if you used a classical computer. But it turns out that there's a way to boost the chance of getting the right answer. Instead of trying to hold possible prime factors in our qubits, our array of qubits holds these repeating moduli of Shor's algorithm, one per quantum state in the superposition. But now, the entire superposition, all elements of the wave function, are related by the period of their repetition. And now it's possible to perform an operation that suppresses all possible periods besides the correct one. Essentially, you cause those incorrect parts of the wave function to destructively interfere, leaving the correct period boosted. Once you read out the period, you can determine the prime factors. So far, quantum computers are stuck under 100 qubits, and none have managed to factor a number higher than 21 with Shaw's algorithm, which honestly, I can do in my head. Does that mean I'm a quantum computer? There are some who would say so, but I reserve my opinion. At any rate, although quantum technology isn't there yet, when we figure out how to build quantum computers with thousands of qubits, even the very high digit RSA keys will not be safe. So how do we fix the problem? Well, the answer is to find one-way functions that don't have a known exploitable quality like the periodicity of prime factoring. That's the goal of a competition currently run by NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Algorithm applicants have been whittled down from a field of nearly 70 to only seven finalists and a couple of alternates, which were announced in June. In 2022, NIST is expected to narrow it down to one or two quantum-resistant algorithms these will become the new standards for public key encryption and digital signatures, and they'll hopefully be able to protect our data from quantum computing attacks. One of the NIST finalists achieves that through the McLeese crypto system, which gets its name from cryptographer Robert McLeese, who developed the hard math problem back in the 1970s. The principle behind McLeese is that it's really difficult to repair errors in large messages. That gives us the potential for a one-way function. Here's a very basic example of error decoding. 
Suppose Alice wants to send a message to Bob, cat, which is represented by the binary string 1101. Once in a while, Alice sends the code, but a bit flips and she sends 1001, which means dog. Bob knows Alice doesn't have a dog, so he's pretty sure there's been an error. So what can he do? Well, Bob can cross-reference his received message. He can add an error to each of the code words. We're working in binary, so 1 plus 1 equals 0. An error of 0100 to cat equals dog, which is the message that Bob got. So Bob can decode the message and know Alice's true intent. But decoding errors becomes much, much harder as the code word size increases, unless you know some things about the code word ahead of time. In the McLeese crypto system, the key is to modify the message in a reversible way to create a very large code word, and then add errors to that code word. Unless you know how the modification was done in the first place, it's essentially impossible to remove the added errors. McLeese does this by coding messages into large matrices. You have a big array of numbers, a matrix, and you scramble it using key matrices and code your message into the result. Then you add some errors. If someone knows the keys, the matrices used to do the scramble in the first place, they can pretty easily eliminate the errors and find a message that makes sense. But without those keys, it's near impossible to decode the errors, and the presence of the errors makes it impossible to brute force the one-way function in the backwards direction. McAleese avoids the periodicity that makes RSA vulnerable to Shaw's algorithm. Computing in parallel universes just isn't helpful here. But there's a reason we haven't been using McAleese. The public key, this giant matrix, is, well, giant. RSA uses public keys on the order of a kilobyte. To secure against quantum attacks for the foreseeable future, McAleese would need an 8 megabyte public key, 8,000 times larger. Right now, network protocols aren't built for this, and it would cause a dramatic slowdown in transactions. This problem is shared by at least three of the other public key encryption finalists, NTRU, Crystal Skyber, and Sabre, which are lattice-based crypto systems. Lattice-based crypto systems rely on the difficulty of problems like the shortest vector problem. Let me explain. Suppose you have an enormous field dotted with regularly spaced points. Imagine also that you're forming giant parallelo pipeds to cover the entire space. This is the lattice. But here's the question, what's the shortest vector or distance from one point to another point? So far, there's no known classical or quantum algorithm that solves it quickly for large lattices. Unfortunately, those large lattices are also why the lattice candidates also have large public keys. Perhaps a bigger issue than the size of the public keys is the question of whether these algorithms are really robust against both classical and quantum attacks. Well, one important factor in this question is the age of the algorithm. The line of thought is basically this. The longer a crypto system has been around, the longer someone has had to break it. If they haven't, then age is a good sign. People have more confidence in a 40-year-old system like the McAleese than more recent lattice-based systems. So will post-quantum cryptography save digital civilization? It's hard to say. It's true that these quantum-resistant algorithms seem like they will be hard, if not impossible, for quantum computers to crack, but that doesn't mean no one will come up with a way to do it. In fact, there's no guarantee a classical computer won't come up with a fast algorithm to solve them. Mathematicians and cryptographers have decades of security to point to as proof for their encrypting and decrypting abilities. But at the end of the day, quantum key distribution proponents would rather put their faith in fundamental laws of physics, pretty darn secure, if only we had a quantum internet. In the meantime, post-quantum crypto may be our only hope as black hat quantum hackers attempt to decrypt your embarrassing emails across the parallel quantum space-time. Last week we talked about a highly speculative idea. Life forms inside stars formed from cosmic strings and magnetic monopoles. Zoltan asked whether these cosmic necklaces would undergo reactions that are faster or slower than chemical reactions. And so, what would be the timescale of evolution or the lifespan of these critters? Well, the answer is that the researchers did not speculate on that, except to say that the reaction timescale had to be shorter than the timescale for these cosmic necklaces being destroyed. 
That destruction is actually slower inside a star than outside. Cosmic necklaces can be locked into the magnetic fields within the solar plasma so they don't fall apart immediately. But we really have no idea how quickly cosmic string chemistry might proceed. The theory just isn't there yet. But what can we say? Well, timescales may be driven by the timescale of the motion of plasma in the star and by the size of these critters. That timescale is days and the size is kilometers. That would suggest slower timescales than the evolution of chemical life. So maybe these things are huge, very ancient, and very, very slow. John Momberg asks if all of this could happen with electric monopoles, given that magnetic monopoles probably don't exist. Well, first let me say that magnetic monopoles may exist. In fact, mainstream grand unified theory candidates routinely predict them. But could we do this with electric monopoles, which definitely exist? Well, sure. I mean, electrons and quarks are electric monopoles, so that bizarre electric monopole-based life is us. I feel so exotic. Many of you pointed out science fiction works that had similar critters. There was Frederick Pohl's The World at the End of Time, where a plasma creature living in a star is at war with copies of itself. There's David Brin's Sundiver and Frank Herbert's Whipping Star, and several more. I really love it when science fiction writers predict things that do turn out to be true. But I also love it when they predict things that almost certainly aren't true, but which still took physicists much longer to come up with. Now, some of you thought it was funny that we would do an episode on life in the sun right after the potential discovery of life on Venus. Well, sorry that our production schedule isn't like 30 minutes. It takes time to do kick-ass animation. The life on Venus episode will follow soon. Don't worry. And besides, don't you think it's important to understand possible life in the sun before we decide what diplomatic relations to develop with the Venusians? Why? Well, Celsius notes that these sun creatures would have had a very different experience in their scientific development. No Copernican revolution for them, where they realized that they weren't the center of the solar system after all. The modicum of humility that humanity developed from that realization would not apply. So they're like, we're creatures made of light and energy and are at the center of the universe, and we're orbited by specks of dust infested by some sort of mud-based life? Ew. So yeah, probably we should team up with the Venusians real quick. 